Now, one of the unique things about humans is that we ask the big question, why? Why do certain things happen to me? Now, I was walking through Coles the other day and there was the, on the Coles radio came the old song by Jewel, uh, which was, You Were Meant For Me. Now, it's a moving song about the incomprehension of moving on from a failed relationship. But the chorus goes, You were meant for me and I was meant for you. Jewel believes there to be a higher purpose in her life and her relationships. We were meant to be together. So how can our relationship fail? It's human intuition that things, that there is a purpose to things. We were meant to be together. There is something bigger over us, guiding us and bringing us together. Things happen for a reason. But the secular account of the universe, which is popular in the world here today in Melbourne, claims that there is no purpose. It claims that these feelings in our lives, that we have a purpose and there's a reason to things, are perhaps a bit sentimental and perhaps even silly. English atheist and scientist Peter Atkins once says, there is no evidence that the universe has a purpose. There's no evidence that humans have a purpose. We are just the current pinnacle of evolution. The secular account of the world is one without purpose. There is no God, nothing guiding or shaping things. There's no purpose to your life. You just exist, you live, you suffer, you die, and that's it. So we wonder why so many people struggle with anxiety and depression and self-esteem issues in our culture when we just say that our culture says there is no purpose and some people just get lucky some people get hurt and there's no rhyme or reason to it. So if the secular account of the world is right, why do humans look for purpose? Why does Jewel sing that you were meant for me? And why do humans who have found purpose or meaning thrive and do better with mental health and life? Why was it that the people with hope and purpose survived German concentration camps like the Victor, uh, Victor Frankl, Holocaust survivor, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning? Well, it's something to ponder because at the heart of today's message, at the heart of today's passage, is the question of purpose. Queen Esther was a young, beautiful Jewish girl who won a Miss Ancient Persia and was elevated to the position of queen. The ultimate rags to riches tale. But did this rise mean anything? Was she just lucky? She just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Or maybe unlucky, just in the right place at the right time, rising to be queen only to satisfy the desires of a lustful, unwise, superficial but enormously powerful king. Or could her rise to influence mean something more. Maybe there was a bigger, deeper purpose for her situation. Well, today, we see that, who knows, maybe, just maybe, there might be a deeper, invisible purpose at play as Esther is confronted by a terrible and awful threat. And this threat comes from an evil villain, a real baddie, who we meet at the start of chapter 3. Now, when websites online make lists of the most evil people in the world, there are a number of people who consistently make the, who is consistently regarded as the most evil people of all time. Joseph Stalin, Genghis Khan, Pol Pot. But there's almost always one person who, when people think who is the most evil person of all time, and that's former German Nazi leader, Adolf Hitler. And well, in the book of Esther, we're introduced to someone who would rival Hitler. We're introduced to the evil villain Haman. Now, Haman is not to be confused with He-Man um, from the Masters of the Universe, from the 80s uh, cartoon. But no, we meet Haman in chapter 3, verse 1. After these events, King Xerxes honoured Haman, son of Hamadatha, 
the Agagites, elevating him and giving him a seat of honour higher than that of all the other nobles. Haman, the Agagite, is our evil baddie. Indeed, when this story is read during the Jewish festival of Purim, it's popular to drown out Haman's name with a noisemaker like a ratchet or a grogger. I mean, that's what that's called, apparently. They, re- they drown his name out whenever it's said. Um, and now Haman, though, was extremely powerful. He was basically the king's prime minister or second in command in the entire empire. He had power and he demanded respect, almost as a god. But we learn that Esther's Jewish cousin and guardian Mordecai refused to give Haman the respect and honour he desired. So we see this in verse 2. At the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honour to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour. Now the reason for Mordecai's refusal to bow before Haman is not really clearly stated here. But I think it has something to do with the fact that the Jews refused to bow as a matter of principle. For such an action may violate the second of the Ten Commandments, to not uh, bow before um, created things. Indeed, this is how the ancient Jewish historian Josephus saw this situation. Mordecai, as the faithful Jew, refused to worship Haman as a god. And I also think this does make sense for the reason that Mordecai doesn't bow is tied intimately and specifically with him being Jewish. So verses 3 and 4, the royal officials in the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behaviour would be tolerated. For he had told them he was a Jew. So it seems that the author here ties... Mordecai's Jewish identity with the reason that he didn't bow before Haman. Mordecai, a faithful Jew in exile in a foreign nation, did not succumb to temptation to follow other gods. He was faithful and true to his religious convictions and he refused to bow and worship to anything other than the God, the Lord of the Old Testament. Now how do you think Haman might respond to this. As the Prime Minister of a multicultural, multiracial, international empire? Well, verses 5 and 6. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Tolerance of alternative religious ideals was not one of Haman's virtues. And as any insecure despot might feel, he doesn't ignore Mordecai's actions. Instead, he resolved not just to target Mordecai, but his whole people. And I think this is because Haman realises that this issue is bigger than just one man. The reason Mordecai doesn't bow isn't because he's strong-willed and independent, but because these actions were tied with the specific religious ideals of the Jews. Those narrow-minded bigots who thought that there was only one God, an invisible God, with no statues and bowed before no man. Hence the influence of this God and these ideas meant that Haman wasn't going to get the respect that he felt, or the honour that he felt he deserved. So it appears that Haman believes the Jews to be disloyal, bringing their religious and subversive ideas throughout the empire. And so Haman resolved to stop this and hence to wipe out all the Jews from the face of the earth. And in verse 7, he sets the date. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the the Pur, that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and a month. And the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. And this is the basis for the Jewish festival of Purim, which means lot. And so the date is set. But Haman needs just one more thing for his wishes to come true. He needs approval from the king. And so he visits Xerxes in verses 8 and 9. And Haman said, there's a certain people 
dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. Now, modern anti-Semitism is generally racial, but here Haman is looking at, a, at the example of Mordecai and the Jews and saw that they didn't conform to the accepted norms and practices of this pagan society. For the Jews did have different beliefs and customs. They didn't bow to pagan deities. And this was precisely how the people of God were meant to be. The Jews were meant to be holy and distinctive from other nations, distinctive in who they worshipped, how they worshipped and how they lived, just as the Lord desired in Exodus. Now, out of all the nations, you, the nation of Israel, were to be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Mordecai lived like this. And by refusing to bow down to Haman, he was holy. Haman noticed and he despised the Jews. And Haman appeals to the king to not tolerate them. And he makes a convincing case. First appeals to the loyalty of the king. These people don't obey the king's laws. And then he makes an extraordinarily attractive financial case where he offers 10,000 talents of silver to the treasury. Most likely Haman thought that he would get this money by the looting and plundering of the Jewish people. And the king accepted the proposal. And so the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. The king, true to his, or true to his character, wanted loyalty. And Haman's proposal had worked. Haman had manipulated the king, a bit like Sir Humphrey in the British comedy, Yes, Prime Minister. And so after the king then makes the order, Haman says with a smile, Yes, Prime Minister. Yes, your majesty, I'll ensure that your edict is, um, is enforced to ensure loyalty to you. And verse 13, dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, king and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. And so here, as chapter 3 closes, a crisis emerges. The Jews, the people of God, risk annihilation due to their evil scheming of the powerful and influential Haman. And so what is the response to this genocidal order? Well, in Esther 3.15, the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Haman and the king celebrated. Now, you know, we know that the king doesn't mind a drink or 300, but the rest of the city, though, is a bit bewildered, wondering, where, where, did, where did all this come from? And then we learn about Mordecai, the faithful Jew's response um, in, in 4 verse 1. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly, and bitterly. Now this was the, the, the posture and dress code of mourning or social protest. Like, for example, King Hezekiah, when Jerusalem was threatened by foreign invaders. And the Jews living right across the empire responded similarly. In verse 3, In every province into which the edict and the order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. It's an understandable reaction when an edict has been sent out outlining their death and destruction. And the edict is awful and it looks hopeless for the Jews. The people of God are facing extermination, the ancient world's holocaust. But this does raise some challenging questions. Weren't, in the Bible, weren't the Jews meant to be the special people of God? 
didn't the Lord promise to Abraham way back in Genesis that the people of Israel would be a great nation with millions of descendants, as many as stars in the sky? They were promised that they would possess a special promised land and all the nations would be blessed through them. But now the land has been taken away. The people of Israel were living in exile. And so God's promises were already strained. But even when living in exile, the Jews could still retain their distinctive identity. At least they were still God's people, even though they were living in a foreign land. But now Haman's edict for Jewish extermination threatened this, which also threatened all of God's promises to Abraham made in Genesis. Made in Genesis. How could they be the special people of God if they were destroyed? How can God's promises of a nation come true? This edict threatened the faithfulness of God. And amidst this danger, this threat, in the book of Esther, God is silent. He doesn't speak. It's almost as if the mighty king and Haman are sovereign and in control of the world. Maybe the Jewish God is not very powerful, or maybe even non-existent. The Jews might well be asking, is God dead? But what about Queen Esther, the Jew? How does she react to this news? We learn that Esther only finds out about this edict to destroy the Jews from Mordecai. She hears that Mordecai is upset, so she sends to him a trusted envoy, Hathak, to find out what is wrong. And Mordecai tells Hathak, Esther's envoy, everything and makes a very bold request. Verses 7 and 8. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Amidst this seemingly hopeless situation, Mordecai has a bold plan. He realised that there, there is one person who could perhaps influence the king and change his mind. Who knows? Maybe, just maybe, Esther could leverage her unique position as queen and go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. It is their only hope. A bit like the famous plea from Princess Leia in Star Wars. Help me, Queen Esther. You're our only hope. In response to this genocidal order, Mordecai and the Jews mourn and look to Esther as their only hope. And so what is Queen Esther to do? Well, she responds to Mordecai and reveals that, well, unfortunately, her relationship with the king wasn't particularly close. Consistent with his character, in many ways, she was King Xerxes' new trophy wife. And their relationship contained a fair bit of fear, making Mordecai's request not entirely straightforward. Esther felt that she and her husband couldn't just chat about this over dinner. So Esther sends a message back through Hathak outlining some significant challenges with Mordecai's desperate request in verses 10 and 11. She instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. The sovereign and powerful king Xerxes lives in unapproachable isolation. What he wills happens and happens on his terms. And only those who are summoned can meet him. Anyone who approaches outside of these conditions does so with the very real risk of death. Even the queen. But even whilst Esther does have a passage to the king it appears that she's not summoned before him that frequently it's been over a month since she was last called to him so we have a big problem yes 
Esther is beautiful. She won the king's favour. She rose to be queen and she's the king's wife. And she does have some power, but she's not free. She and all her people risk death. She might be in a position of prominence, but she's a captive in captivity. But Mordecai is persistent. The urgency of the situation for him and his people means that he pushes back and highlights the danger that even Esther faces. Verses 12 to 14. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance from the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? But for that, you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai highlights the mortal danger that Esther is in. This edict is for the destruction of the Jews, including the king's queen. Then as Mordecai pleads with Esther, he paints two alternative scenarios. One, if Esther remains silent, and then a reason, perhaps, for her to speak. And see there in verse 14, Mordecai trusts that help will still come to the Jews, even if Esther is silent. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance from the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Mordecai is truly a faithful Jew. It seems that he does trust in his God, the Lord, the God of the Old Testament, and his power and promises, despite the seemingly impossible situation. He acknowledges that many will probably die, even Esther and her family. But Mordecai expresses a deep trust that God is not dead. That somehow, in some way, through Esther or not, God will be faithful to his promises. Mordecai trusts in the Lord and he trusts that help will come from the Lord himself. Perhaps like the faith of Abraham in Genesis 22 when he was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. Even though he could see no other way, Abraham expressed trust that the Lord would provide. Mordecai trusts that the Lord will provide. And then perhaps though things seem hopeless, there might be a way. Mordecai suggests that perhaps the fortune or misfortune of Esther being elevated to queen could be used to help influence things to satisfy the purposes of God. And he suggests this with perhaps the best known verse in the book of Esther. And who knows, but for that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Maybe, just maybe, Esther's rise to power could be for a reason. Maybe, just maybe, the events of the world are not simply random. Maybe, just maybe, the mighty and powerful King Xerxes and Haman are not completely sovereign and there is another more powerful, invisible force shaping the world. Maybe, just maybe, God isn't dead but has silently manipulated the events of history to allow a possible way out of this seemingly hopeless situation. So maybe, just maybe, God is faithful to his promises and the Jews will be delivered and, and will remain God's chosen people. Mordecai asks, who knows? Who knows? Well, the God that the Jews and that Mordecai and Esther serve knows what will happen. Proverbs 19.21, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Psalm 33, the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Even though he is silent, even though he doesn't say anything direct here, the promises of the scriptures is that the Lord does have a plan and a purpose. And he is faithful. And this is what Mordecai is alluding to when he asks, and who knows 
that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And Mordecai is convincing. For Esther reflects that, well, maybe, maybe, there, maybe just maybe there might be a reason for her situation. And she looks at her royal position and she asks, why? Why am I here? And so she resolves to do the bravest thing that she's ever done. Verses 15 and 16. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther resolves to risk her life to save her people. For who knows, maybe, just maybe, she has come to the, her royal position for this reason. And we find out what happens to this gripping tale next week. I'm sorry we have to leave it on a bit of a, a, bit of a cliffhanger. Um, you can't read ahead, of course, but you also have to come back again next week to find out what happens. But as we close now, at the end of chapter 4, we realise that Esther, the story of Esther is a story of God's providence, that the Lord will provide. That even though at times the events of the world may look random, things happen outside our control, all things occur under the care of our sovereign God. Although invisible and unseen, God governs the world. Rather than being a meaningless place, our world is infused with purpose and meaning. Hence, Mordecai is right to trust in this God who works and directs things all to their appointed end. But in the book of Esther, God is silent. For notice that the name of the Lord hasn't appeared in the narrative. In fact, the word God or Lord doesn't appear in the entire book. But even though God is never mentioned, he is not absent. He is active But in the background, for in this book we see God's invisible, providential dealings. Which is perhaps how the book of Esther connects with us today, here in secular Australia. Where we look around and we feel that maybe God seems to be silent. And his people are losing. and Losing influence in the world and the loss of Christian values are being eroded from our society. And his people are being marginalised and persecuted. But the message of Esther is that God is still there working in the background and the comfort is that we are never in the grip of blind forces or fortune our world and our lives are not ruled by chance or fate but by god we follow a purposeful god our world is purposeful his his purposes Now this doesn't mean though that we won't have to face hardship or difficulty. Queen Esther was made queen of a selfish, superficial, lustful, prideful, awful man. But the book of Esther challenges human sovereignty. Who knows? Maybe, just maybe, there's a more powerful force in the world than powerful rich men. And maybe things happen for a reason. I once met the MasterChef winner, Kate Brax, uh, she won MasterChef a number of years ago and she, was, she shared with me that as, as she was going through the competition, she was wondering that if this was the right decision for her just to enter MasterChef. She was a keen Christian and, she, and a mother of young kids and she felt was it right for her to be away from her church and her family to participate on this TV show. And she almost, actually, almost accidentally entered the competition anyway. I think her husband entered for her and she didn't even intend to enter. But as she progressed... And she got closer and closer to the end. She thought, is this the right thing to do? But then maybe, just maybe, God has a purpose in all of this. And who knows? Maybe he did because she ended up winning. And maybe God's purpose for Kate wasn't that she would necessarily be successful and famous, although that did happen. But maybe his purpose was that she would have a platform to tell tens of thousands of people about Jesus, which is what happened. Our God is a purposeful God. But his purposes are connected with his plans in the world, which is to bring all things under Christ and to glorify his name. 
Now, Queen Esther's purpose and plans were directly connected with the big plans of God, the preservation of his people. But it can be easy for us to confuse a purpose which is potentially selfish with God's purposes in the world. And to discern this requires wisdom. Wisdom to see how our purposes can connect with God's vision for the universe. But one thing that we can be reminded of is that our universe is not meaningless. And as Romans 8.28 says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Our world is not meaningless. God is purposeful. He works out things out for the good of his people and with things in accordance with his plan. So today let's be reminded that amidst the uncertainties and the difficulties of life, God is there, silently, behind the scenes, working out his purposes, even using unexpected and humble people like Queen Esther, and we're called to trust him. Let's pray. Father, we read today the comment to Queen Esther, and who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Even though to your to our world today you appear silent, you, you actually still speak. You guide, you enable things to happen in accordance with your will. Amidst the challenges and opportunities of life, help us to trust in you and your sovereignty, knowing that you work your purposes through every situation. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close today with the Father indeed we praise you from whom all blessings flow. We praise you all creatures here below. We praise you above our heavenly host and we praise Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well next week we continue the cliffhanger uh, which we've had to leave it a bit here today as the story of Esther continues and we'll confront Esther's bravery and we'll explore that a bit more next week. In the meantime, have a great week. I think the youth are coming now to, give, uh, to serve morning tea. So please stick around, have a cuppa and have a chat to some people and look forward to seeing you back here again next week as the story continues. Thank you.